morning, everyone. I'm Charlie Fink, here with my partner in crime, Ted Chilowitz, futurist at Paramount Pictures, to talk about This Week in XR with our friend, Rafaela Camara, the former global head of strategy and innovation at Accenture XR, and currently a strategic advisor for a variety of market makers in spatial computing, including the Women in XR Fund who we know very well. Uh, wonderful to see you again. Thanks for jumping on with us. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Rafael. Nice to see you. Hey, so um, let's not um, pussyfoot around here. The story of the week is they want to break up Facebook yeah. and not just the federal government. I mean, it's like Facebook woke up and like the posse is a mile out of town. <laughs> Yeah, so, so Charlie, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this, as I know you have, and this is not the first time I've thought about this because there's been uh, these discussions around Amazon for months, if not years now. Um, and right before we, we started our podcast, I asked Raffaella a very pointed question about where she grew up in Italy. And um, let's, let's redo that question for everybody because I think it's going to be interesting and telling uh, when you started to tell me about your hometown and what it's famous for. <laughs> so I am from a, a beach city called Pesaro, and that's on the Adriatic coast, about four hours south of Venice. And uh, it's famous for high-end furniture, particularly kitchens that you find in some of the super expensive homes here in LA. Uh, also for a famous opera composer, Rossini. And for anyone who follows MotoGP, Valentino Rossi, the most famous uh, uh, motorcycle racer of all times is from Pesaro and was one of my mom's uh, elementary school um, kids, actually. Interesting. So, so the reason why I bring this up is because there's a lot of discussion about the raw and massive economics of very large entities. And these are not U.S., even though they're based in the U.S., they're not U.S.-centric companies, Facebook, Amazon. They are world domination <laughs> devices, right? Um, so we talk a lot about the, the money problem with that, but what's not often talked about is the destruction of cultural individuality, right? So, and, and certainly in the West, in the U.S., people tend to like big and vanilla, and they like one sort of entity that you can go to to sort of get everything we're not really big on individuality and small, uh, interestingly enough, culturally, right? So there was a period of time when the country and a lot of people were up in arms around Walmart and Walmart sort of basically destroying the individuality of America, the small mom and pop shops, the small places where you would go to buy things that were different in every city, in every in every part of the United States, right? Seems like no one talks about Walmart anymore because Walmart has effectively become the little guy, which is sort of surprising, right? That Amazon at 20X Walmart now, Walmart, nobody, the government doesn't care about Walmart anymore, but the government used to care a lot about Walmart, used to talk a lot about Walmart. Now the government cares about Facebook and Amazon. And it's a difficult, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to talk about it, because it's a difficult, nuanced discussion, right? Because we all know the value that certainly us that work in the VR community get from a large monolithic company like Facebook pouring dollars into something that's nascent and bringing it to life, right? But there is a downside, and the downside is the, the cultural sort of whitewashing of the whole thing, yeah. the giant walled garden the difficulty from, for smaller companies to exist and have their individuality. But so also, let's, like, let's stop yeah. for a second and just speak economically. Yeah. Um, the breakup of AT&T was the most dreaded thing that had ever happened to corporate America. Right. And I would posit there'd be no internet without it. Right. You know, there'd be no Verizon without it. And poor old AT&T, now has a media empire and is pioneering 5G. Yeah. So, uh, you know, 20 years later, 20, 30 years later, I guess, um, you know, it, it has been fantastic for the economy. And, and I, people I were really believe an independent, a, an independent Instagram would have been another Snapchat. Right, 
And people were really worried when you go back to the AT&T story, when they started to break up AT&T, you could talk to people all across America that were super worried about AT&T being broken up because they really liked AT&T. It was, it was their value quotient. They could rely on it. They understood it, right? So this is not an easy thing to, to discuss and debate. It's, it's definitely not a one-sided argument. Yeah, but I think that the the other part I was reading the the four provisions that the they're asking of them, right? Breaking up of Insta, taking away Instagram and and, and WhatsApp, and they have to get uh, approval for anything for any investment over ten million dollars. But I thought the other one that was very interesting for me is when they were asking for. Uh, they cannot impose conditions on accessing its APIs and data that are aimed at restricting competition. What that means is that um, not only um, apps, different apps now have the ability to be on multiple platforms and not have to worry about it, they can also up operate the way that they want and it opens up the market for uh, data gathering and data management. All of a sudden, it's not just the big uh, platforms that will own people's data, but it could be uh, at the hardware level, it could be at some other level, and some other players could become the distributors and maybe a little bit more Switzerland-like distributors of the data. I thought that was a very interesting um, request that they were making. Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting conundrum. In many well, ways. the Oculus side of this is interesting because, uh, you know, Facebook obviously is right now invested heavily in the Quest, although the Quest is still number two behind Sony, yes. whose, uh, you know, VR games are in a vertical just like Oculus is. So, yes. you know, they're picking on Oculus. But what about PlayStation? There's 5 million of those in the wild. They expect to sell to almost double this year, although they continue to downplay VR because their non-VR game business is so huge. Um, you know, they're still not caring a lot about it, but they think that they will someday. Yeah. And, you know, 10 million units is not something to joke about. It's going to take, you know, Oculus two more years to get there. So they both, they both are building verticals on top of their own software. They want to control that. It, it's just like the apps on smartphones. Um, so if that's wrong, then the app stores are wrong. Yeah. Um, and it's an interesting argument on the economics of the headsets themselves, right? There's a discussion. Take that away and all of a sudden you've destroyed the hardware business. That, that Facebook is losing between 50 and and $100 every time they sell a Quest. Right. So they are seeding and helping the market grow. But the flip side, the devil's advocate, is they're also basically limiting competition by essentially selling things at a loss. And by the way, Amazon has, has deployed that strategy for years. There's a very right. famous story. Uh, we don't have to go into it now, but there's a very famous story you can look up about diapers.com. And if you want to know the cautionary tale of a very large company destroying other companies, Look about what Amazon did to diapers.com. It's a it's something worth looking into. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in defense of Facebook, I don't think that they're trying to destroy uh, companies or apps or, or, or new companies in, companies in XR. Uh, it, it is, however, uh, complicated if you start putting so many restrictions on what they can do that you stifle their competition. But I think we know better than anyone is, in addition to the hardware, they are funding a lot of the content. They are funding yeah. a lot of the new solutions and the new applications. So it's 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 uh, it's interesting, and um, I hope that it just means that there will be a little bit more freedom for everyone to create and and distribute solutions across multiple platforms, which is what we need if we want the, the market really to take off. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, when you sort of boil down the argument, we all would say that, you know, to use the colloquial side of this, that there is absolutely value to the little general store, the little company store, the little mom and pop that's building artisan goods and something wonderful that you can't get everywhere. Well, wasn't that Beat Saber? And then they bought it, right? Exactly. They're going to buy anybody who starts to scale. Right, exactly, right? So, so it's a Beat Saber's interesting study in success and potential, you know, they, they sort of go to the dark side, right? Because here's a couple of young independent developers 
they start making some money, but they have to hustle, right? They have to put it out on every platform and they have to work it and it's no doubt hard, but it becomes a piece of legitimate hit content and now they're making real money, right? And they become successful and they could arguably be successful, but likely the dollars that Facebook paid them to be in their world were exponentially larger than they would have made on their own and, and probably would have ever made on their own, right? So sometimes it's like you become the hit and then you cash in, right? Um, it's just- So it's you super know that, that of course I have my angle on this, which is this is a problem. The big problem, they're, they're after Facebook for the wrong thing. Mm. The problem right now is unintended consequences are uh, running rampant and they're hurting society. Yeah. There's nothing to do with money. Right. It has to do with mind control. It's, it's an unintended consequence of their, of their, their, their it, it was just, they were just trying to make money from advertising. Mm -hmm. They didn't think it was mind control, mm -hmm. but that's what it is. And so they've reacted the way oligarchs react and said, well, okay, maybe it's a problem, but we'll take care of it, right. not you. You stay away. But it's got political consequences, as I said, not as you said, not just in the United States, but around the world. Right. It is also an orgy of exhibitionism, uh, child exploitation. Right. Uh, they have a 35,000 person army trying to tamp it down. They're not co connected to law enforcement, even though these, there's massive evidence of crimes. And, and so I don't know how we, were, we would have been okay 20 years ago agreeing that Mark Zuckerberg should have control over our lives. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that no one is studying the psychological effects, both on adults and especially on children and teenagers. You know, and, and, and there's no regulation of that. And it has promoted a change in our society whereby we are infinitely available and rarely present. No. So, you, you know, I want to go after the bad things about Facebook and preserve the good ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, Oculus, without that context of that company that has done, I believe, unintentionally bad things mm -hmm. and acted very, very human. I mean, you, you know, laws are constructed because humans are flawed. And, and in many ways, predictably so. That's why industry is regulated. So, you know, without those regulations, you know, we really will be, would be a third world country, would have been a, a third world country much sooner. But, you know, if, if we believe that capitalism needs to be managed, then by any standard, it is out of control. But yeah. my biggest concern is that I don't want Mark Zuckerberg to be the decider about wars. Well, and yeah, not because I doubt his motives, but I doubt he is equipped and it should not be the judgment of one man. It should be the judgment of a collective collection of people who have divergent views to come to a consensus about what's good for society. So, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is not the enemy, but he is a man and he is just one man. Mm -hmm. And, and whatever committees they form, those are still committees that are controlled by Facebook. Right. And it should be controlled by all of us for the benefit of all of us. And if that diminishes their ability to sell me funny t-shirts, well, then that'll be the result. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I think that the other layer that is rarely discussed, just like the cultural influence of this that's rarely discussed, small versus big, is, if you do, if we do go ahead and try a breakup strategy of effectively a virtual company with virtual goods, this is very different than breaking yeah. up railroads, right? Yeah. Because who actually has the underlying ownership, the economic ownership? So you can technically- Yes, this is a very good point. AWS, you could technically break up Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. But if the ownership is the same stockholders, right? If Zuckerberg and all of the people that own all these entities still maintain ownership, which will be much harder to extract, right? Once you break it up, 
you've effectively done the same thing, right? Because they all live off the same APIs, the same software, yep. the same virtual goods and services. So it's not, it's not a simple argument. Well, right, because you could just move off. I mean, it's really like literally there is no factory. Correct. You could just see the posse two miles away coming for you, get your boots on and ride out of town and, <laughs> and always be you know, always two miles be ahead of them. The exactly right. Yes. So, so I, I mean, that's always an option. But I don't hear anybody discussing Plenty of places in the world where they would be welcomed and, uh, and unregulated. Yeah, and I just don't hear anybody discussing that part of the problem. Yeah, is. You know, go ahead and try and break them up. But if you really think you're going to break them up, you're yeah. not going to break them up. Yeah, right? we'll really find out who's got the power here. Who do you think on the XR side, who do you think is going gonna, is gonna to benefit greatly from this, if it does happen? Mm. And it's going to take a while to determine that. Yeah, but well, well who, who do you think? You've always been yeah. kind of a you know, non-objective uh, you know, person in your role, um, agnostic, so to speak. I think companies like uh, Snap, but also Niantic or Epic even, that already have their platform. I would just say Steam. Say what? Oh, yeah, that too. Yes. So anything that has already an audience, a platform, the technology, and so, is trying to um, grow, grow the user base, grow, grow the, the, the data, grow, uh, you know, the apps and the solutions that are on their platforms. I think those are the ones that are going to benefit the most. I would think. Oh, for sure. I mean, they're, they're Sony, Microsoft, HP, which is trying to establish a foothold, uh, would all be uh, tremendously boosted, and especially Steam, which is like Epic Games, a private company that is, you know, doing a lot with metaverses and building, uh, you know, uh, massively shared uh, experiences. So uh, they would definitely, uh, you know, get a huge advantage from that and the chaos surrounding it. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, to see if they succeed with this and, and how long it could, you know, this could drag on for a decade. Yeah. And, and if you look at uh, what happened, even uh, look at what happened between Qualcomm and Apple, it almost forced the, the, the companies to concentrate so much on that lawsuit that a lot of other things did not happen. A lot of other investments or different things that they could have done kind of like got stifled because they were busy with that. So it will be interesting to see the repercussions at a variety of different levels. So let's talk about a, a few other things that happened, because as I said, I think we're going to have 10 years uh, to talk about this. <laughs> um, it looks like Enreal is uh, launching, Enreal uh, Spatial <laughs> Smart Glasses is launching in Europe in the spring and not in the US. Yeah. Ted's going to show us his developer version. That's what they yeah. look like. Badass. It does not look like normal glasses, but it does look badass. Yeah, it's getting getting better, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The, the problem, as they explained it to me, is no 5G in the U.S. Right. You know, they want to go to markets where there's a concentration of 5G so that people can, you know, have the best experience with their device. Because it's not just bad on 4G, it pretty much doesn't work. Yeah, it's sort of unusable on 4G. Yeah. So, yeah, but at the same time, you could use it uh, on Wi-Fi, you know, through through your phone, and still still do a still actually have it be very very useful. Um, I think we had done a, a project with them and and developed something with IHG back uh, last year. Uh, yeah, and we finished it a year ago. So it's been long, uh, long coming, uh, you know, they're, they're coming out to market and, and, and having people be able to use them. They, they're certainly not quite there exactly where, with what we expect the air glasses to be, but uh, at least what I noticed is that um, users are more than willing to give up a certain level of immersion for a familiar and light and bright and open type of device. So uh, the more we can put them out there, I think the, the better it is. Go ahead. I think it's a little bit of a falsehood in the US about 
like not having enough 5G because at this point, the major city hubs, many major city hubs have 5G deployed to a certain extent. Um, so where a lot of these users would be living and working with this device, these first level adopters, there actually is 5G in the US. Like where I live and work already is 5G enabled. Like I have 5G on my phone right now. Um, and almost every major city in the US has some degree of you can find 5G and there would be enough of a user base here. Albeit this is not even to the scale of VR in its tiny little version, right? This is much smaller than that. But there is definitely a valid market in the US for these type of devices, even if they believe their success is tied to 5G deployment. That exists today. It's a falsehood that it doesn't exist. I wonder if it's not more a matter of what type of partnerships they are able to close uh, mm -hmm. with uh, which more. providers. Because I, I have a difficult time, mm. you know, believing that Spain would have a better 5G coverage than, you know, major cities in the U.S. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah that's a really, really good point. Uh, let's see. The rest of the week, well, Snap had SnapFest. That's their, um, what we would think of as their developer conference, mm -hmm. uh, which was, uh, I thought, pretty successful for them. Hundreds of thousands of people tuned in. And... Uh, and I thought the sessions that I sat in on, but mostly the big overview keynote ones were, were pretty interesting and they continue to put the camera first and they are not giving up with glasses as an entertainment device. So uh, good on them. Uh, I think the next thing we might see is uh, them finding a, a world map to use uh, with the smart glasses. And you know there could be several sources Google certainly sends cells map data, and uh, Niantic is quickly, at least in urban areas, uh, building a world map off of Pokemon Go players uh, who are plentiful, as plentiful as they have ever been, uh, and more active and more under control of Niantic. So uh, continued success in the AR world there, and I think it will merge with glasses at some point. Um, oh, and here's the final one we should talk about before we sign off for the week. Sandbox VR emerges from bankruptcy. I think that, well, it's not, first of all, the main sandbox. It's their American subsidiary that all the uh, celebrity money, et cetera, went into to expand their simulation centers. Uh, I, I think their bankruptcy was more about their lease responsibilities in the pandemic um, you know, they were in very high-end malls, which are still hard and expensive to get into. And I think, you know, the lease uh, liability when the mall is shut down, it, it's just, there's no way to handle it. So it, it sounds like there was uh, some, that, that it was motivated by that, uh, rather than there being no viability. But I do think hanging over all of location-based VR, not location-based entertainment, for which I think there'll be a lot of pent-up demand, but specifically within location-based entertainment, the part of it where you put on a shared headset. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, do kids won't care. What, what do we think? Or people will own the Quest and not care? Or do you think that, that VR still has a chance in public places? Well, that, that to me, is a, it, it's a good round trip to our first part of discussion, right? Because that is one of the ultimate expressions of small ball, mom and pop, valuable in lots of ways, valuable from a learning standpoint, but probably never going to really be an economic force until it lives inside another sort of monopolistic organization, Disney, right? Which is huge and can deliver on the promise of that level of entertainment. When Disney decides to make a VR park yeah. at some point in their future, it will find success in very different ways than even like companies that raise, you know, 70 to $100 million and have deployed in malls, it's just not a big business, right? Now, folks like us are going to support it. We're going to be part of it because we believe there's a pathway to it. But ultimately, 
the monopoly of deciding what to do with VR as an entity is the real economics are this is a home and somewhat industrial and business case device. It is not really a replacement for theme parks, right? Um, and there will be a business and people will make some money just like the, the local candle shop that sells candles you know, on your corner, but it's not Amazon selling a bajillion candles to everybody's home because they want a candle in their home. Right. So, so this idea that there's going to be uh, 300 void locations or dreamscape locations, uh, you know, that they're going to be as plentiful as movie theaters is just not. I just great. don't think that's the reality. Right. Yeah. I think it's a mom and pop business. And there's nothing wrong with a mom and pop business. Like, sure. it's a fine thing to have mom and pop businesses. They have individuality. They have importance in their local community. They have importance even in their regional community. People will drive 100 miles to go to some place, but it's never going to be Disney or Universal Studios until an entity comes in and builds Disney or Universal Studios around something like next-gen technology, and it'll likely be Disney or Universal. Do you think that, Rafaela, do you think that anybody, there are VR parks in China that are supposed to be met? Do you think that there'll be VR parks in the U.S. that are awesome, like a Star Wars park, maybe? Yeah, I mean, if it's not a, just a VR park, uh, you know, to go back to what Ted was saying, I think it will be a part of one of the major parks uh, where that's one of the things that you do. I had a little bit of a difficult time seeing how germophobia is not going to really affect people for a longer period of time and putting on a vr headset is a particularly it, it, um, it, it, it makes you think of that more than yeah. doing a lot of other things it, it, putting and, something like that on your head is very intimate yeah and even if you think about kids wanting to do it who maybe don't have as much of a uh, of a worry about that well the games are so expensive for a kid that usually you have to have your parent there with you and I have a little bit more of a difficult time seeing, you know, parents. For 300 and bucks, everybody's gonna have one of these. Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, but, but having said that though, it's completely different, right? Because you truly are fully entertained when you go to, you know, when you go to the void or wherever else you go, because mm -hmm. you have every other aspect of it that kind of comes together. But I agree that most likely it will be in the major now, uh, now here's the counter argument to that because there's always a counter, right? You can look at companies like Chuck E. Cheese that went to scale in a version of location based. You can look at Dave and Buster's, not the biggest company in the world, but certainly a company that has hundreds of locations, right? Using a technology that lives in the home, gaming and screens, and make it an out of the home entertainment experience at a certain scale right? And Chuck E. Cheese at a certain scale. Oh, right, because they can have sort of that, like, remember that ride machine that they put in? Yeah. Motion-based that could do like eight people at once and, and was screen-based, no headset. Right. Yeah. So I think so, you'll get that. I mean, I think, you know, there will be businesses that will capitalize on immersive entertainment and find something different than you can do in the home. It's just that the home experience with the VR headsets we have today that are just going to get better and better is so compelling. It's, it's part of why the PlayStation 5 is the most yeah, so, you know, A dollar a minute out of the home is going to be a rare thing mm -hmm. because we have the main attraction at home for 300 bucks. What, what I will say, though, is that I think that mixed reality headsets that start to look like glasses combined with effectively dead or dying mall location space will become a valid entertainment venue at scale at some point. People will I, just I like think, they walk around. I just think that them. opportunity exists. And Rafael, that will be the last parting thought possible, or is Ted in a science fiction dream now? <laughs> but no, no, no. I think it's uh, I think it's completely possible. In fact, I can even see uh, before before everyone has them, I can even see going to Disney and being able to rent them for the day and just being able to do a few things, right? Pay a little bit more. You trust Disney that they have sanitized them and whatever else, and you can walk around with them. Yeah. I see that happening more than- That would be cool. Than... So Tinkerbell really would be flying around Disney. Absolutely. I think and you can, you can be entertained while you wait in line. It would truly be the magical world of Disney. <laughs> 
I think so, that's coming. In our lifetime, we're going to see that. And, now, and uh, it looks like Disney's dream of being Netflix's competitor is actually coming true. Boom, right? Uh, yeah, they yeah. are. They are. If you saw the Disney investor conference uh, where they. Threw my down, Disney retirement plan is very. Woo. They threw down hard on content this week. My man. Disney, my Disney retirement plan is is one hundred percent in Disney <laughs> stock and has been since uh, nineteen ninety one. So uh, it is a good thing indeed. Uh, but you know, again, big getting bigger and draining you know initiative and entrepreneurship uh, of opportunity, particularly for people uh, you know outside of big tech centers. Well, we've been so, arguing. Uh, that's that's what we got this week, ladies and gentlemen. Rafael, it's uh, first of all, you look very happy and oh. relaxed, and you look great. And <laughs> thank we, you. We always have fun talking to you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys. All right, have a great week, everybody, and we will see you next week to talk about uh, the world of tech some more. Bye, guys. Thank you.